for Mr. Hughes, from the time that you became program director at WOL, take me to the time that you met P.D. Green. Well, I heard about P.D. for, for years, even uh, when I was in the service. Um, I was stationed in New Orleans, and I would come home, and my brother was an inmate at Lorton Prison in Lorton, Maryland. And uh, his cellmate was P.D. Green. So uh, he'd like for me to come visit him in my army uniform. <laughs> and so I did, because everybody said I looked nice in it. So <laughs> it worked out. And he talked about this guy, P.D. Green, all the time. And uh, I didn't know he was setting me up for um, later on. Mm -hmm. But I knew of P.D. I didn't meet him until you know uh, the first time he showed up at the station. In the movie, they depict me meeting him on a visit with my brother. That didn't happen. That was some Hollywood flavor we put in to make the transition cool. But he showed up at the station unannounced, totally. <laughs> OK? I didn't even know it was out. I mean, the movie, we, I didn't know either. But I mean, he, you know, he showed up. And uh, my brother had been you know, sucking up to him because of his popularity in prison. So my brother enjoyed the perks of being a friend of P.D. Green. And he kept Petey on a string, telling him, when you get out, my brother's in radio. He's going to put you on the radio. And uh, that's, that's how I met him. Yeah, that's how I met him. And um, you know, I, I dismissed him. And I could never get him out of my head. And um, you know, he ended up uh, on the air. And uh, it changed the flavor of the city. Actually, changed the flavor of media. Because there was nobody on the air like him. Yeah, and it was my job to protect his right to be rude and crude and be P.D. Green. So the ratings soared on radio, and then you guys transitioned that into te a television show. Um, P.D. was invited, Dr. King, 1968. Um, the whole climate of media changed. P.D. was invited to do a television show at Channel 26, the PBS affiliate in Washington, and it was sponsored by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and it was an employment program. There was a white male who was doing it solo. Petey became the co-host, and uh, as things escalated, they wanted to expand that to an hour, um, and they were looking for a black producer to head up this, so Petey recommended me. I'd never been in a television station, you know, before. And so think about it. I helped him get into radio. He was the bridge that got me into television. And I was kicking and fighting like, no, I don't want to do it. And um, summer of 1969, there were nine one-hour programs, community-based, financed and sponsored by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. I was the producer, it had a staff of about maybe seven people, all had to be community-based. So one of PD's ex-prison uh, 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 mates was a production assistant. Actually, um, a, a real kind of interesting story, Felicia Allen at the time, Felicia Rashad, she was a freshman, and her parents wanted her to come back to Houston in the summer to work there. And she didn't want to go back. And they said, OK, if you find a job in your field, you can stay there. And she came and she told me the story. And I, I hired her. She was a production assistant. And uh, on, on this summer thing, so our first time in television for all of us at uh, ETA. And the program was called Where It's At. And I kind of did what I did on radio, brought the community in, put them on camera as opposed to put them on my mic. And um, so we did nine one-hour shows. And uh, then NBC opportunities opened up for, for me. And uh, it was just crazy. I mean, it was crazy. So that transition from producing to directing? Directing, you know, d the whole package. Writing, hosting, um, editing. I did it all. I wasn't trying to be a television um, celebrity or somebody who was going to make their life in television. Because the way I looked at it, from where I come from, if you're in some place 
that they didn't want you for all these years and all of a sudden you're here. Why would you assume that you can plan to retire in this industry? So my thing was experience as much as you can. Don't cheat it. Make sure that the way you got in, which was community-based, serving the community, do that. And uh, I think out of everybody who I worked with and met along the way, I'm the last one standing because I never disrespected radio and I never disrespected television and for sure never disrespected the community. So then you ended up owning the radio station. And that came totally from left field. Okay. Never thought about ownership, um, but P.D. Green is the one who he knew Kathy Hughes before I did. And he knew Alfred before I did. And he used to talk about Alfred, this little 12 year old genius who he couldn't break as he called it. And he wanted me to meet him. So I met Alfred, you know, before I met his mom. Uh, but I knew her because her reputation at WHUR is, you know, the quiet storm and all of that. So she was a monster, you know, on, on, on right in this town. And, um, but Petey, his thing was the three of you all, well, me and Kathy, y'all need to team up. You all could take over this town and media. And I'm kind of, get out of here, you know. But he was brilliant. He was brilliant. Quietly and behind the scenes, he was brilliant. And his perception was okay. And when you, when you, when you look at that and you think about the thousands of young men and women and communities that we don't even give consideration to, how many brilliant people are behind this persona of rough and tough. And, um, and the problem with you know, getting them out of there is you try to make them lose the rough and tough as opposed to, hey, refine it so it's not disruptive, but be who you are because who you are is where your genius lives. And that's what I did for Petey. I, I, you know, I wouldn't let anybody put the way he rolled down. You know, he has the right to say what he wants to say as long as he doesn't disrespect the FCC or, you know, and, and uh, we rolled that way. And he was the man in this town. He was the man because he was, he was for the people. And I was very proud of him. And he could, he could, he could say things that I wanted to say, but I couldn't because I got in facilitating public affairs. In 1965, when I started helping that news director, he was the news director for four news people at an AM station back in 65, unheard of, okay? And they covered the black community. Unfortunately, the four news people were all white uh, males because they had experience and they came from news. Okay, so boom, that's who was hired. They had some interns they were working to, you know, but there were six hours of community affairs programming that was taped during the week and we played every Sunday. No station nowhere in the country was devoting that much time to community affairs programming. White, black, any, and especially black. But the reason the guy did that, the owner, when he first applied to come in and buy at the station and change the format, the other two black stations said, no, it's unfair. Washington is a small market. I mean, it's a big market, but we already have two stations. Another station doing black music, and it's just going to be unfair, you know, fighting for the small dollars in advertising and stuff. So he went back to the drawing board, and he proposed to do news coverage to the black community and six and a half hours actually a week of community affairs programming. And I met the news director who was responsible for both of those. So I would be there after work and I would tape, he started allowing me to tape the shows. And one of the shows was Howard University Speaks. And he had a student from fine arts uh, 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 who moderated it, and she brought guests from Howard or related to Howard and interviewed every week and played it back on Sunday. And WCP had an hour, the poverty program, UPO had an hour, um, and um, 
SNCC had a, uh, uh, 15 minutes and, uh, you know, there was a youth program and stuff, so I facilitated all of that. And you know what is crazy? Is that that was the first time blacks in our community had a voice that large on their own station and owned by a Jewish guy, but he loved the black community, he really did. And um, WOL, 1,000 watts during the day, 500 watts at night, is still talking. And it's talking 24 hours a day. Think of the power of 1965 when this started, how strong it was, kind of under the radar, because it wasn't the largest part of the audience of the radio station the disc jockeys were, because they were great, okay? But it was so strong, it's still rolling. It's still rolling. So in essence, you pretty much created a new formula. A new formula. I facilitated it. I walked into an opportunity and I didn't disrespect it. I don't like to say I created it. It was already created. I, 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 I didn't mess it up. I didn't let anybody pay me under the table to be on a program. Uh, anybody who wanted to be on, even if I didn't agree with them, boom, it was the community program. And uh, I had that kind of reputation. And I took public affairs very seriously. I'd been lured to New York, to LA, to, 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 to step it up, okay? Because I'd won some Emmys and stuff in TV when I got into the TV game and stuff, but I said, I'm not leaving radio. I haven't done my, finished doing my work here in the hometown where I grew up. And why would I go now that I'm in a position to take an opportunity in a whole new arena where public affairs and the community is secondary? In Washington, it's, you know, it was still rolling. So I, I hung tough because I knew down the road that I, I, would, I would get, my karma would be good. I didn't know about karma then, but I'm just saying <laughs> the principle of it, you know? And uh, remember now, um, Max Robinson, you, you know Max Robinson, you know the name, okay? He was uh, slated to be the first black uh, solo anchor of a nightly news show weekly. Frank Reynolds of uh, ABC had announced retirement, so ABC announced that Max was leaving the local CBS station here. He was going to be there. Frank Reynolds, I don't want to call him a racist, but his neck was a little red, okay? And he rescinded his retirement and said, I'm not going to retire now. So they couldn't throw Max out in the water, so they brought Peter Jennings from London over, and they kind of co-hosted it, and they put Max as the third anchor in Chicago. So they had a three-anchor thing they tried, and blew his opportunity to be okay. And um, so, I mean, I, there was that, because remember Max used to be um, a furniture sale ma salesman down at a furniture store down by where the, the Verizon uh, Center is called Peerless Furniture because my girlfriend at the time used to be a secretary there. And he was, you know, had done radio in Richmond and stuff, but he was waiting for an opportunity here to, you know. And he was sleeping on the couch of uh, Hal Walker. Hal Walker was the first black uh, national uh, correspondent for CBS Network News. So you saw a lot of history uh, uh, and a lot of we, yeah, we lived together, we, 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 we ate together, we, we, we part of the national media group we created and stuff. I, yeah, I was, I was there, you know, with all, all, all the giants, really. And Washington, Washington, number one media town in the world, you know. So your story couldn't happen today, the way it happened then? Um, well, no stories can really happen. I mean, they happen when they happen. You know what I mean? I mean, um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's what it is. Uh, I came in at the right time, and um, I was the right person for the right situation, um, and it paid off for me. And I could have gone left, could have gone right, and, you know, did a little celebrity, my head could have gotten big, and I could have, you know, lost perspective, and my journey would be different. It would be different. So you're an Emmy winner, a director, a writer, producer. What, what, what's left? for Dewey Hughes, what, what's left in your career that you haven't done, that you would um, like to do? Well, I, uh, I think I've done 
most things, because I got so many opportunities here. I've managed artists. I've produced music. I've, uh, you know, promoted concerts. Um, I've done, you know, any, if there was an opportunity I was interested in, I went for it. But I didn't go for it to try to make millions and millions of dollars. I went for it for the experience. So promoting didn't last very long because, you know, it's like you, too many people you got to deal with. And uh, we did, um, the Redskins went to the Super Bowl in 1972, me and a partner of mine. We did the Redskins ball, first Redskins ball. Um, and the Redskins, they were there, and Petey was one of the, you know, the, the MCs and uh, you know, some of the disc jockeys from the station and stuff, and uh, um, we're gonna give the money to Sick Cell and Children's Hospital, and so it was a fundraiser and stuff. And um, it was utter chaos, okay? Um, because at the time, the Muhammad Ali and a lot of other groups were having fundraisers all around the city and everybody was stealing the money. So we got lumped into the group that, boom, Children's Hospital and Sickle Cell didn't get any money. Well, the reason they didn't get any money is because everybody involved got money. I booked Gladys Knight and the Pips to be in the ticket sold. But about four days before the concert, Gladys had a temperature of 104. She was in Atlanta and the doctors were advising her she couldn't come and perform. So we had to let the audience know and <laughs> people started <laughs> refunding their tickets. It's like, oh, so they gave us Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, the replacement, but at $1,000 more than Gladys was charging. So I'm like, okay, and the fundraiser, okay. And the people don't know that out in the public. So the ticket buyers said, we don't want Smokey, we like Smokey, but we want Gladys. So my partner got on a plane, went to Atlanta, got a doctor down there, uh, gave Gladys some shots, and uh, the doctor agreed to fly back with her so that she could at least do two songs, okay? So that we could, boom, and she did it. She was a trooper, and she got on stage. Her temperature still 102, whatever, okay? And uh, she got on stage. She did about uh, 30 minutes because it was so hot and stuff, you know, boom. But we had to pay both Gladys and now Sm Smokey and his group because we had both of them because they canceled the contract to cover for Gladys. So, you know, I said, no, this promoting, it's okay. So, but I left town, went on a little vacation. I think I was in Spain or somewhere, okay. A friend invited me over and... Um, so somebody calls me and tells me, hey Dewey, the headlines, and it's that your company has uh, gave this concert and the foundations didn't, you know, get any money, blah, 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 and they lumped them in with all the others. I was the only one who interviewed the reporter who was doing the story, so he just flipped it a little bit. But the good thing about radio, when I got back, I talked about it. And what I had done long before this happened is that I sent out receipts and a cover letter to all the Redskins and everybody who was involved, and they saw where every penny went, and they saw why there was no money for, okay, because we were in a deficit, all right? And, um, but I, I'm, I'm just that kind of guy, I wanted everybody to know what the real deal is. And, uh, but I, I stopped promoting, you know. I, I, did a, I did a promotion, too, at the Kennedy Center. Uh, a friend of mine, he played Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar. Carl Anderson, I don't know if you know the artist. He, uh, from Lynchburg, came here to go to Morgan State, performing arts, came to D.C. for a weekend, never went back to Morgan. So he's, his career kicked off here in Washington. And me and a partner, we managed him for seven years, and we got him in Superstar. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We had a friend at William Morris who, um, the last day of auditions, they'd already had Judas. It was a guy by the name of Eric Money or Mercury or something from England. He was going to play, he played G Judas um, in, in England, and uh, they were going to open concert tour here in America. And Friday was the last day of auditions because they were looking for other singers and sing, and Carl got a courtesy. It was a favor. And Carl went on stage. He killed him. And uh, they bought out Eddie's uh, contract and... Uh, you know, his, his career. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly.
So I managed, we managed him for seven years, and you know, he did a couple of movies after that and stuff, but you know, I, 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 I used to manage football players too. Managed four Redskins. Yeah. 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 So a man with as an extensive career and as, as many talents as you, you're a writer as well. Well, so. the writing part has always been a dream of mine, but I wasn't really a writer. You know, I thought I could write, but my stuff was, you know, it was just too mushy and, you know, you know, so it was more emotional than anything, but I thought I was a writer and I realized I wasn't, you know. Uh, when I was young, I wanted to sing like Frank Sinatra. And um, that was not popular in the community I lived in. So I had to be a closet singer and I said, oh, okay, so I'll never be a singer because that's who I want to sing like. I couldn't sing like Marvin and, uh, you know, Billy Stewart and all the guys I grew up with. So I wanted to sing like some Sinatra, and I don't mean I could sing like him, but I wanted to take his approach to delivering a song message, the articulate, uh, the phrasing, and pick special songs to fit my personality. And I thought I could do that, and I was willing to work, but, you know, that was, that was so far-fetched. But look where it got you. Well, well. Uh, I, I have friends, and uh, most of them are singers. So I've vicariously been a singer through them. So you kind of got a chance to, to be a singer. Indirectly. Indirectly. Yeah, indirectly. Right. Yeah, yeah. So at this stage in your life, um, I've heard that, that you started writing again. You picked up writing again. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> since talk to me, um, even, you know, folks at the studio said, we'd like to um, see what and read the Dewey Hughes story. <laughs> I said, well, that hasn't, I ain't even considered that. I have no idea, <laughs> you know, where to begin with something like that because there's so much of it, okay? And, you know, I'm a kid who came from South Carolina um, and uh, the midwife was the wife of the plantation owner that my mom and dad were sharecroppers on. I was born in a little log cabin. She delivered me and she asked my mom if she could name me. And I got the name Dewey because her great great uncle was Admiral Dewey. And uh, that's where I got the name from. And Dewey wasn't really popular in my crowd. My homies teased me a lot about the name Dewey, okay? And, um, but I, I got it from, you know, this, uh, the white owner's wife who uh, brought me into the world. So I never saw myself uh, living in the South. It was a good foundation for me, but I never saw myself settling the way people had to settle down there to coexist, okay? I'd go to the balcony and blacks couldn't sit downstairs. I didn't get mad, but I'm like, this is not right. So I, you know, and I, it, people wanted to go to the movie. I wasn't excited about going to the movie, but I didn't voice my opinion and stuff. So early on, I was carving out that I'm gonna do something different. I didn't know what. And um, the truth of the matter is that with all of my experiences, I have not yet done my best work. We're looking forward to it, and I think that now's a prime opportunity for you to... Well, I'm, I'm in the process of, of obviously connecting with that because I'm at, a, I'm, 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 at a, I'm at a good place, and I'm glad that my journey has brought me here because the clarity, the peace of mind, the lack of drama um, is, is just so prevalent in my, in, 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 in my, in my life. I know I'm looking forward to hearing the Dewey Hughes story, and I'm sure a lot of people out there are looking forward to hearing your journey. Well, I'm writing it in reference to relationships, not as a novel or a book. I'm just revisiting relationships from the time I met this person and what this person meant in reference to my, you know, uh, exciting journey at those times and stuff, and that, that's how I'm writing it. And it'll be a puzzle to put together. Who knows? We'll see. You know, we'll see. It's yeah. an interesting concept, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's the only thing I, I would be comfortable in because I can't imagine myself 
thinking that I could write a book. My attention span is, and that's why I like writing lyrics, okay. you know. And my writing kicked in. I was telling you about the young kids in South Central. Uh, I mean, gangbangers at the beginning of the gangbanging, okay? And there was a school for the dropouts, and I started writing about these kids. And the little, little phrases, little rhymes, but I, you know, had, 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 a, had, a, had a point of reference and uh, re some revealing stuff, but complimentary more than negative, okay? Um, but very real, okay? You just pinched that girl on her butt and turned around and, you know, pretend you didn't do it. And I'd make that into a rhyme. I said, you saw that? I didn't hear it. And boom, boom, boom. So they kept encouraging me to write, and I said, start writing. And I'm more of a subject matter writer. You give me a subject matter, boom. You can write it. Yeah. But from the style that I used to get the attention uh, of the young people there, because they didn't like me. I'm this light-skinned guy coming from the west side to South Central. And I didn't go every day because I wasn't a teacher. I was just, you know, just supportive of the school. And uh, they said, you just come over here to feel good. And I said, okay, all right. You know, but I was the one who would take them to lunch, uh, took them to recording sessions. Not all of them, but I mean, they just like a few, but I mixed it up and uh, took them out of the neighborhood. They never, many of them never been out of South Central. So they, they learned to like me in spite of not liking me. Right. And when I started writing, and my writing kicked in, I said, if they like my writing, this is my style. Because if they like it and don't like me, I'm on to something. And I've written about 200, uh, 200 songs. Wow. Yeah, in a nine year span. In a nine year, that's what I did. I, mean, I, I wrote, 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 wrote. Well, Mr. Dewey Hughes, I'm looking forward to seeing what you write and what you come out with your memoirs or relationships that you document in whatever form, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in reading it. So on behalf of Quiet on the Set magazine, we thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I wish I could make embrace stuff. It's gonna make me wanna wake up in the morning and go do it and see if I can impress someone with it. Wow, okay. So your life seems to be a little bit of luck, opportunity, preparation, and, and tenacity. And, and, and not getting a big head and taking myself too seriously, okay? Because if you're already in media, so you've got spotlight. Mm -hmm. Whether you're on camera or not, you help in spotlight work, you right. know what I mean? Right. So it's like, uh, why get a big head and, okay, I never acted like a producer, I never acted like a director. I mean, the first, uh, the Where It's At shows, I've never done television before, okay, so, I met with this director, I'll never forget his name, David Dorsch, at WETA Channel 26. I went to him because he was assigned to do the show. And I said, I don't know shit about television, okay? And you have my permission. This is what I want to do. I'm going to trust you that you're going to make it, you know, work on television. And he did. And after four shows, I had it. I said, I can do this. But David was like, no, I'm not trying I'm just to comfortable <laughs> at that point. Right. So I had to pull him aside the back room and say, David, <laughs> you show. remember how this started? Okay. So right. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what okay. advice you can give to up and coming people in radio? How to get into radio or? Well, I think the greatest advice I can get, give to someone, don't get into radio trying to use it to get into television or to get into something else. Do it because you have a love for radio and you give radio everything you have and don't disrespect it. And um, it will give back to you. I'm living testament to that. I'm living testament to that. It's, it's about, yeah, and the habit of being true to everybody you meet. Okay, even people you don't like, you don't want them not to do good. Why, why not? You, you complain about a bad world, but you wish bad on somebody. Uh, you know, let them do good. Even if you don't like them, they do good. We all benefit. The world would be a better place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much.